Welcome back to God's Business, where I interview the top Christian influencers, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders on how you can create not just a good business, but God's business, where he's the multiplier of your success. I have a guy in here that's been super impressive to me. Not as not only has he written multiple dozens of books, sold millions of copies. I think you're at 15 bestsellers now, maybe more. That one, one thing I saw actually said 14. So you've done another one since then launched a new book, One Truth, and just has been a major influence in people people like Ed Milet, who he's with yesterday. Influence in my life has spoken into the guys inside of King's Brotherhood. I'm honored here to bring him in to go deep into his story and to take some principles away for your guys' life. Welcome, Mr. John Gordon. Nicholas, great to be with you. Yeah, excited, man. Welcome back to Austin. Great to be back. Yeah, and you took time out of your day on a, this is not a work trip. You took time out of like a family, relax, like hangout trip to come do a podcast and you don't need to do that. So I appreciate it. I appreciate you. And you know what? This is important stuff. This is God's business. So let's talk about God's business. Yeah. And I I love how you've always incorporated God into every, really everything that you've done. Obviously your walk has, has changed. Even walk us through that. You got like 20, is it 28 books now? 28 books. 28 on the, I didn't want to miss the nose of it. 28 books, 15 bestsellers. How has that journey of faith changed from authoring books and then your relationship with Jesus may be changing and how have the books changed since then? When I first started writing, I, I was not a Christian. So I started writing, I started speaking as a non-Christian and it was funny. I would get actually, I'd actually go give talks and people would say, I could tell you've been saved. You've been saved. Haven't you? And I'm like, no, I haven't. What do you mean I've been saved? <laughs> and so even then, I guess I was exuding something about my future, about what I was becoming. Yeah. And on this journey of faith, I eventually you know, gave my life to Jesus. I wrote the energy bus as that was happening. And people said they could actually tell the story. And you could tell, like, as I'm becoming a person of faith, it actually evolves in the story. Wow. You can actually feel the energy and the essence. Because books are the essence of the words you're writing and the spirit you're writing with. So think about it, those words. The essence of you is on those pages. And when people read it, they're actually feeling that. And so people could actually tell the energy I was giving forth in that book. So I gave my life to Jesus around that time. And that obviously influenced my writing, who I was, how I was thinking in a major way. It's not a Jesus book. It's it's a business book, but I dedicated that book to my, to my mom. And I also wrote, I want to thank God, the father, the son, the Holy spirit for the inspiration to write this book. Cause I wrote that book in, in three and a half weeks. Wow. And every book I've written has been about three and a half to four weeks. People often ask me, do you have a ghostwriter, John? I must not look smart enough to write a book. Cause people ask me that so often. I said, no, I write my own books, but I have a Holy ghost writer and really God writes the books through me. I'm not the author, just the pen in many ways. Wow. And so I really get these ideas. I get these visions of what the book should be. I have a blueprint for it, a framework. Like once it comes to mind, I know what the book's going to be. And I begin writing that book. And I don't have the whole book figured out, but I start in the beginning. And as I start to flow, more and more just comes. I write in the morning when I first get up, take a walk, pray. And on this walk and prayer, I get new ideas, come back, write some more, and I'm done for the day. At night, I edit what I wrote, and then I go to bed, and I wake up, and I start again. And when I'm editing at night, I also get ideas, and I'll write down those ideas. So they're fresh in my mind. And so that's how a book evolves. And the book starts to write itself. Wow. The story starts to tell itself. The ideas start to, to come together like a puzzle. And at the end, I could see how God literally orchestrated this book for me, and ultimately, it becomes the book I'm meant to write. 28 books, as you said, 15 bestsellers, millions of copies. Yeah, That's the process. So I know God is behind this. That's why I can give all credit and glory to God because I'm not that smart. I'm not that great. I know where my power comes from. I know where the ideas come from. I know where the ability to write comes from because I never knew I could even write until I started this process in my 30s. When I said, God, what am I born to do? Why am I here? When I wasn't a Christian and I was miserable, I was negative, I was struggling... And my wife threatened to leave me. She said, if you don't change, we're over. And it was in that moment I said, God, what is my purpose? Why am I so miserable? And why am I here? 
And that's when writing and speaking came to me in that moment. And so to write all these books later, for God to speak to you and say, writing and speaking is what you're meant to do, that influenced everything. So yes, I'm all about God's business. Wow. And God is at the center of my business. And everything I do is really about being obedient to God. Like we're doing training now and leadership training. That's because I know I'm meant to do it. I didn't want to do it. It's a lot easier just to write and speak. Yep. Now I'm running a training organization where we are actually developing leaders, building stronger teams. We have a day of development event that we're doing now in multiple cities. We have a John Gordon certified now where people can get certified in my programs and go teach it and share it. That's the multiplication factor. And the cool thing about these books is like positive leadership, the power of positive leadership, that book I measured against Jesus when I wrote that book, like every principle in there to be a great leader is how Jesus led. And I measured those principles first and foremost, did Jesus lead this way? And if he didn't, it didn't make the book. So it's a secular book and yet it's influenced by the leadership of Jesus. So we're teaching now leaders around the world how to be a better leader. Now, did I want to do that? No, I just want to write and speak, but God was basically bringing these people into my life, these trainers and consultants who were coming to me and wanting to teach my stuff and then became a part of my team and then said, hey, what about this? And it really led to this group of people that I have that are amazing, all Christians, all great people, all in the marketplace, all business people. And now we're doing this and I'm answering the call, even though it's a lot harder. Like I'm now running a company in addition to writing and speaking, which is hard. You're on the road, you're writing, you're speaking. I'm reviewing drafts of the energy bus for schools and a new book we're writing. Difficult conversations don't have to be difficult while I'm also running this company and having to prepare for every talk, every podcast and so forth. So it's a lot harder, but I'm just being obedient to it. I think that's the key message here, being obedient to, to God's plan, to God's will, not your own will, and discerning what that is and then executing on it. I like that you said that, that that was uncomfortable for you, that writing, maybe even the speaking is kind of your comfort zone right. now, because I feel that a lot of people think that the will of God will always be something that they're really excited about. Like, I wouldn't run men's events. That makes me feel super uncomfortable. I don't even like meeting new people that much. So, And I interview people all the time. And I'm like, ah, oh. like, it, you know, at least the interview gives me something to talk about. But right. just the whole process isn't my natural thing. I would just work on a skill. Just get good at the one skill. So I love that you touched on that. There's three core things that that I think were really big out of there that I want to break down and unpack for the people listening. One of them was that when you got saved, you were already in the activity that you're doing, writing, speaking. You talked about that. How did you discover, you'd said that God told you that you were meant to be that. There's two cool things in there. One, God was already developing you and you were using your gift prior that he had given you. And then he could breathe on it and have it go. But did you ever question it when you got saved going, am I supposed to do something else with my life? Like, is this what I'm supposed to do? And was there any process with that of you going, oh, wow, this is what God has called me to do? Because many people do that. What's my, what am I really supposed to do? And they never really feel like the thing in front of them is what they're supposed to do, especially if they go through that big experience. The first two books that I wrote before being a Christian actually dried up. Like they didn't do great at all. They didn't do well. They had my picture on the cover and they just weren't the books that I was obviously meant to write and share for the rest of my life, for my career. So the interesting thing about that was, is that they did dry up. And in the drying up, I was in this wilderness period because I write these two books. They don't do great. And now it's hard to find a publisher to write another book. And it was during that time where God met me in that wilderness because I'm thinking about pursuing another career, that this is not going to work. I had sold my restaurants. I had owned a, a few restaurants, sold them to focus 100% on writing and speaking. Opening the restaurants, by the way, was a big part of God's plan too, because I opened up these restaurants, second mortgage my home, $20,000 in credit cards, don't know if we're going to make it or not, hanging by a thread. And he carried us like every step of the way, like almost bankrupt and money would come in almost bankrupt. I get a consulting job to teach people how to sell wireless technology, which was really advanced at the time. We were bringing wireless data to mobile devices. This was like the first of its kind. Now it's ubiquitous, but we were doing that. And I was at the forefront of that. And this company said, Hey, teach us that. I said, well, I don't know the technology. They said, no, just teach us how to sell it. They paid me $13,000 for six weeks of consulting. And that money literally carried us 
until we made our first profit in the restaurant. I mean, I saw it firsthand God's hand on our life. But again, wasn't a Christian, but I saw him moving in me. So he had this plan even before I knew it was my plan. So now this is happening and I write these books and I think I'm going to take off. It's going to be awesome. People were like, oh, you're going to be the next Wayne Dyer, you know, the next Deepak Chopra, because I was more of a new age. It was like mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual energy that I was talking about. And so I thought, oh, this was it. I get on the Today Show, four-week series on the Today Show called Get Energized Today, back in 2003, 2004, and the book is out. And it, like, boom, was real quick. And then goes down. Like, that was it. Disappeared, like, what is going on? It was crazy. And that's when I started walking. That's when I started praying. That's when a friend of mine gave me sermons from Erwin McManus that said why I follow Jesus. And it spoke to me for the first time. And that began to mold me and shape me to accept Jesus, to receive Jesus. Jesus. And that began the change of my heart, mind, and soul, and the change of my life. And so... Here I am now doing this work now as, as a Christian, I'm doing it. Now, there were moments I come to faith. I actually reach out to Erwin. We start to become, you know, acquaintances. And I said, I think I should join the ministry, right? So I was going to go into ministry. He goes, no, no, yeah. no, no. You're great right where you are. Mm. The world needs you where you are. And looking back, great words, because I really do see myself as a marketplace ministry. Like I'm here to go out and share to the marketplace these leadership principles, these team building principles on how to live your life, how to develop the best you. But along the way, right, people start questioning like more, more of the meaning in life. Different people will reach out. People will follow me. They'll start to understand my faith and what my faith's about. And they actually see something in you that they want in them. That was me. I, I saw in Ken Blanchard, the one minute manager author, sold over 20 million copies a great business leader, great business author. He wrote the fables back in the day when no one was writing fables. He inspired me. He encouraged me. He was my mentor. I saw that in him. And I remember thinking there's something in him that I want. So it was like Irwin, the sermons, plus finding out and knowing Ken was actually a Christian and a, and a late follower of Jesus like me, found him in his thirties or forties. I was in my middle thirties. So there was a lot of a lot of synchronicities there that, and a lot of things all coming together. And I saw that and that made me say, okay, I can now share that with others. Now it wasn't like I was doing it intentionally. Like I'm going to do this and I'm going to lead people to Jesus. and I'm going to be this way. It was just what God was calling me to do. And I look back on it and I could see his plan and see how I was doing it. And to this day, I'm not going to try to convince someone to believe in Jesus. I'm just going to live that way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share these principles. I'm going to write books that will inspire people. The one truth teaches people ultimately about oneness and separateness. And again, I'm not trying to convince you that Jesus is the answer to the separation, but he is. And once you understand that he is, you realize, oh, there's so much truth of that. I was just with Erwin McManus just, just today. We were just doing a podcast for his new book and we were talking and he came to a point where he, he realized Either Jesus is God or there is no God. It was one or the other because God is an all loving God. And Jesus is the only one that actually came for us. Everything else is you have to go to God, that God's waiting for you to get to him. And believe it or not, like when you have the power, real love is when you give that power to others mm -hmm. and you come for others with your love. And that's what Jesus is. He comes with this incredible power, but this love to actually give you power, to give you life. All the other religions is like, no, you have to come to me. I am the all powerful one and you have to get to me. And that's actually not a God that's a God of love. And so for him, it came to be, well, either Jesus is God or there is no God, which made so much sense, right? And so for me, I'm not trying to convince people of that, but when you understand the truth, the truth just makes so much sense. So as I'm going out doing this work and I'm in business, I know my place in, in the business marketplace, but at the same time, I'm also a person of faith living my life that way. And that wasn't that popular then. Not, not even entrepreneurship was as popular as it is now. My dad owned a carpet cleaning business. 
and it was like embarrassing if you picked me up from school and like the branded stuff, you know, it was nowadays it'd be like, oh yeah, like my dad owns a business, yep. you know? So it's, it's cool to hear that, you know, the, the whole marketplace ministry, even the mentorship, you had someone there around you that could kind of speak into those questions, which yep. I think is a core principle that people could take away is like, do you have people that you can bounce that idea off of? Hey, I'm feeling, should I be going into ministry? Or sometimes we think, should I do this? I'm great at it. And people go, you're not good at that. Right. You're, you're good at this. And sometimes we just don't know. We need mentors. We need people who can speak truth into us. And also God will use others to call you toward your destiny and move you towards it. Yep. So for me, there were people who spoke into my life, but knowing why you're here and what you're meant to do is, is really important. Now, again, you may not be living your ultimate purpose right now, but any job you have, any business you have is an opportunity to actually share your greater purpose. It's all a vehicle and you have to decide to live on purpose for a purpose. And the more you do that, your bigger purpose will be revealed. And my prayer often is God, use me for your purpose, guide me towards my purpose. And whatever that is, I will do it. If God said tomorrow, stop writing and speaking, I will. If you want me to do something else, I'll do it. There are things I want, but I'll also say, God, if you want this for me, you got to show me. If you want this for me, you got to orchestrate a few things because I'm not going to chase it unless it's meant for me. Mm. So I only want to do what's meant for me. And I think so often we have to be willing to be open, to be patient, to be used and to honestly pray to the point where you start to hear God's voice and spend time with God so that you will actually be able to discern his voice and know what he's calling you to do. Did you, were you always this way and good at speaking? I'm only asking because there's some development. You obviously have to hone a craft in, but Tiger Woods is pretty good at golf when he's like three, right? So it's like my three-year-old does not swing club like Tiger Woods. Also, just your journey on top of that, like, what made you get into the restaurants? Because I'm thinking about other people that are on journeys, maybe with their families. That That's difficult. Like the day may have never come that you hit the restaurant business or that you had the best-selling book and 3 million copies sold. And there had to have been tough times in between those. So prior to the restaurants, talk about your career to the restaurants and why you then, speaking and publishing books is nothing like running a restaurant. Right. So they're very random, yeah. But but I'm assuming there's some something in there, and then just the difficulty of the in betweens. People often think like if it's meant for you, if you're supposed to do it, if God has this plan, it's going to be easy. Yeah, right. God's going to give you peace. God doesn't always give you peace. He often allows you to go through the turmoil and all of the angst and the stress to figure out what it is you're meant to do. It's part of the plan. You have to wrestle with it. You have to actually go through the challenge, the test to ultimately come out on the other side where you have a testimony because God uses our challenges. God uses our obstacles. He uses people who may be our opponents, those energy vampires, others who don't believe in us. He will use all of it to test you, to sift you, to make you realize like, is this meant for you? And to refine you, to grow you, to make you stronger. And so everything is ultimately a test to help you grow to be who you're meant to be. So when I first started speaking, it was difficult. It was challenging. I was not a great speaker early on. And there were moments I wanted to give up because it didn't go well. And I didn't know what I was doing. And I was doing my best. And there were moments that I was telling great stories. I thought I was funny. And my wife's like, yeah, but you're not taking me on a journey. And she came to one of my talks. She's like... I'm in a little ADD and you're just telling me great stories, but there's no connection between them all. I'm like, oh, okay, that's a great point. So then I started coming out with like seven ways to do this and five steps for this. And I would orchestrate my talk around five principles or three principles, depending how long they were. And so I started doing that. And then I understood that Jesus taught through principle, story, application, principle, story, application. So I began speaking in that way and that helped a lot. So it created some guardrails as a speaker on how to create these guardrails. And then within the guardrails, you can maneuver and also be spontaneous depending on the audience and the crowd. And it's those moments with an audience, as you know, when you're not expecting to say something funny, but you do and they laugh and you're like, where did that come from? That's the magic. That's the magic of being in that moment. 
sometimes you can give so many talks that you're thinking about the last talk or you expect it to be the same way. And what I've learned is you got to be present with that audience. You got to be in the moment with that audience. There's a new thing going on with you and them. And then when there's that connection between you and them, there's that oneness, that's when the magic happens. So it's about trying to create that space for that to happen. It doesn't always happen. Some crowds are difficult. There are some comedians that they bomb at that nightclub. Meanwhile, they're the best comedians on, on earth. There are some crowds that no matter what you do, it's just not going well. Yeah. And there are moments you leave and you go, you thought it was horrible, but then someone reaches out to you and says, man, I needed to hear that. Or, wow, you changed my life. And maybe you were there for that one person. So along this path, yeah, I've grown a lot, developed a lot. I'm a hundred times better speaker now than I was then. I think I've got a lot of room to grow. So I'm, I'm getting even better. Like someone heard me the other day said, man, you are so much better than you were even five years ago when I heard you. Mm. And that's the goal. I'm like, yeah, I don't want to be the same. Yeah. But it also means I had a lot of room to grow. Some people are naturally better early on. There were moments that I was great, but I wasn't always consistently great. And now I prepare a little bit more actually. So I'm, I'm even older. I don't have to prepare as much based on what I've done and your accolades, but at the same time, I now am preparing more to get even better, to make an even greater difference. So I'm, I'm actually stronger, more impactful, more powerful, thinking about stories, how they relate, how they connect more than I've ever been. So I'm actually more excited about speaking now than I used to be. I always consider myself a writer who spoke. And the other day I was with Ed Milet. He said, you know, you always said that. He goes, but I really think you're becoming a, you know, I really think you become, he said, a really great speaker who also writes. So, so that's the shift. Like how can I move people with words? But I still think I'm a writer first because a lot of my, a lot of my stories and talks come from the things I write about. Initially, you'll get the idea you write and then how can you weave it into a story? And do you enjoy the whole process of speaking the, you know, I, I just went to a men's event right before my men's event. I didn't want to go, but I already know. I know myself. I go, when I show up, I'm going to love it. And and sometimes that's the way it is for me with the speaking. I'm like, all right, I naturally don't really yeah. want to do this. And I put pressure on myself and I want to do well. And then I always love it. And Or the, the, the podcasts I do like in general, being on them. I love right. not having to prepare as much because you just get asked questions. Right. And, okay, let's go here. Do you enjoy the entire process, the pre-talk, the the talking, the post-talk, all of it? Do I enjoy it? There's nothing like the feeling of being in the moment when you're sharing something that's powerful and you and an audience are having that experience and you know you're making a difference. No better feeling when you're in that zone and in that moment. And there are other times, like playing a sport, a sporting event or in a game where it's not going well and you're battling. Tennis players feel this all the time. There are moments that everything's clicking and other times when it's not, but it's in that grind. It's in that mix. Steve Martin writes about this in his book. Steve Martin, I forget what it's called, but it's a great book that he talked about comedy and everything. It's about doing the work in those moments when there's a struggle, but still finding your way through it and still overcoming. I don't enjoy those moments but I think those moments make you stronger in the long run. But that feeling when you're giving a great talk and there's a connection and they're laughing. Yeah. And so you're talking about when there's a hard audience or yeah, just a difficult, that's, a, that's difficult. But when you, but when you're with a great audience, it's, 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 it's a blast. It's, there's nothing more energizing when I'm loving it and I'm loving the moment and I'm not worried about what they're thinking. Then it's a great talk. When, I'm worried about what they're thinking and I see someone yawning over there and this guy's not looking and he, he can be not looking just for one moment, but all of a sudden you're allowing that person to affect you. I don't like those moments. And again, I, every speaker will experience that, but I'm just verbalizing it yeah. and being real about it right now. Are you there, nervous those, before you talk at all? I think to this day I am because every, every speaker should be, it's like game day for me. Yeah. And there's always that. As they say in game day, that just means you care. Right? Is that but it's also, there's this thought, people say you care. That's a little bit of a bull crap, to be honest, because it's like there's in the back of your mind, there's this thought that says, maybe I don't have it today. Yeah. Every game I played as an athlete, there was that moment that said, maybe I won't have it today. And that little speck of doubt 
that little slice of doubt actually makes you prepare more, mm. gives you a little pause of adrenaline, but it actually could be your demise if that voice becomes too loud, if that fear becomes too much. So you have to make sure you you address that. And I've been doing a lot lately with um, with prayer. You know, God, give me your power. Give me your peace. Mm. Give me your strength. Have me say what you want me to say. Have me do what you want me to do. Help me be bold for you. Help me win this spiritual battle that's going on in every moment of my life, especially even when I'm speaking. Sometimes it's a spiritual battle. Like ever since I've been talking about the one truth, as I get up there, I'm getting attacked. Like you would not wow. believe spiritually because I'm now sharing this message that's really powerful. It's yeah. a game changer. What's an example? Like what, what do you mean? How am I getting attacked? Yeah. A negative thought came in like the other day that said, remember that woman that wrote on that survey a few years ago that had the negative comment? And that thought came in. Why would that thought come in for me? I would not choose a thought like that. That is a spiritual battle, a spiritual attack. Wow. And in that moment, you got to go, yeah, I'm just making a difference for this audience right here, right now. But it, was, it tries to keep you from making a difference, tries to keep you from sharing this message, tries to keep you from your destiny. You're always going to be attacked in the place of your destiny. I've talked to pastors that experience this. I mean, you're always going to be attacked in those places. It just means the stakes are higher and you got to prepare for the battle. So there are moments that I was getting my butt kicked in the moments, but it's cool. It never affected my talk in the end. But it's like the first minute or two, I'm wrestling with that with that voice. And by the time you get into it, then you start to flow and you start to win the battle. At the end, I've noticed in those, those when I'm feeling that, the talk is always the most well-received. It's always the most powerful. It's the weirdest thing. Like the greater the talk, the more powerful the message, the more powerful the experience for the audience, the more you go through the battle. It's like life, right? You go through the battle, but the more rewarding it is. So as a speaker, that's that's what you're facing on a, on a, on a daily basis. So you've got to prepare your mind. You got to prepare your heart. You got to prepare your soul for sharing this message. You can't just go up there and go, oh, I'm just going to tell some jokes and have some fun. If you were, it's easy. But once you start sharing a more meaningful message and a powerful message, like the one truth where you're sharing the truth that is exposing the enemy and the enemy's lies, and you're sharing God's ultimate truth with people that are going to help them live their power, live their purpose, move towards their destiny, and ultimately create the life that God has called them to live. When you're sharing a message like that, well, you better believe you're going to be attacked on the journey. And your kids will be attacked too. And so as a parent, I have so many pastor friends, so many friends who are authors, successful business people, their kids are always attacked because the enemy knows he can't beat you. So he tries to attack you at the weakest link. And so often it's your kids on the journey trying to mm -hmm. get to you or discourage you and distract you. So it's about how do we armor our families, bring our families into the fold and help them become stronger along the way. How, how, what's an example of how you do that? Because I could see a lot of people that are in business and stuff, they're going, okay, I'm going to wake up early. I'm going to get my morning routine. I'm going to do all this stuff. But it is sometimes difficult. Even I think it was back in the Rome days and all of that, they would always adopt someone who would success them because their kids were always a mess because they were so focused on the kingdom that the kids got no attention. They'd never been through anything hard. So they would always actually adopt somebody oh. and then they would, that would be their heir because it would be their kid. Wow. And it was always the worst kings were always the ones that were actually their lineage right? because they just weren't prepared for it. So I look at that and I go, wow, that's not a good stat. Yeah. But how often does success paint that picture? How do we equip the kids or protect, protect them, like equip them? What's a, what's a way that someone could do that? You bring them into the family. You keep them connected. You develop a relationship with them. You make time for that relationship. I remember Cole came in one time. I was writing a book. He was a little, hey, dad, let's play ping pong. No, I'm busy, Cole. Comes in, dad, ping pong. I said, Cole, I'm busy. Comes in 10 minutes later, dad, ping pong. 20 minutes later, dad, ping pong. I said, Cole, I'm writing a book about engaged relationships. And I realized I wasn't <laughs> engaging with the most important relationship of all, my son. Yeah, That was a wake-up call. We started doing family meetings early on as a family. So we would get together as a family, we'd sit around a table and we would talk about 
our goals. We would talk about our mission. We talked about our family mission statement to love and honor God and all that we do. We each came up with a word for the year, one word that would give you meaning and mission, passion, and purpose. We would talk about our word. We would talk about what challenges each person was facing and how we could help each other overcome that challenge. Sitting around the table after I would read a devotional and having these conversations was incredible. We still remember it to this day. The kids still remember it. They're 23 and 25. We would go on vacations together in July and December when things slowed down for me. Made time to be intentional with the family. When I was home, I was very intentional about spending time with them. I was gone a lot, but when I was home, I made it a priority to be present with them. I was asked the other day if I had a lot of friends back where I live, and the truth is I had a laugh. Like I don't have a ton of friends because all those years I was so just focused on my family mm. or I was gone on the road. I didn't develop the friendships as I wish I would have, but I also made my family my biggest priority. So I think that was important as well. Having a church community, fellowship, obviously, is is really important. But making time together and spending time together was so important. To this day, we're on a, a text thread, us four, and we're, we're always texting each other different things. And I think that's a big part of our bond and our relationship. Even my son the other day said, hey, guys, I got this idea. It's a business idea. I think, you know, people are struggling with their food allergies and everyone's suffering with their health these days. And I want to do something around healing with people and we should do it together. You know, think about that. Now, that's not something I want to do, but would I help him do it? Yes. So it's cool they would present that idea and want to do something with us. College, he was like, we wouldn't want to do anything with us. We don't even want to talk to us. That's the other thing. There's a lot of moments as the kids are getting older, they don't want to talk to you, but you got to keep talking to them. You got to keep investing in them. You got to keep calling them. They're not thinking about you because they're in their teens or they're in college. They're living their life. Now, my wife and I, were out to dinner with friends and they keep calling. We're like, we're busy. We're having fun. Like, leave us alone. We'll call you afterwards. But it's funny that our kids are reaching out to us and wanting to talk to us now, which is funny. Yeah, and it was established at a young age. You had cadences. You made a priority. Yeah. So you're poured into them. Yeah, you you could have made friends. But also, even if you made friends, it's still keeping that priority if people are doing that. Right. I, I liked the also sharing the faith with the family, just yeah. the devotionals, but also not just that where you're learning about them. You talked about their one word and what are they thinking or going through and, and how can you help support? That's not just talking at them. Just to synthesize it down of what I'm taking away from it. I think those are really good. I know that you've also worked with tons of sports teams as well, which I think is is interesting because I even struggle with this a little bit or a lot of it maybe, is I, as an athlete, I like to grind. Like I, I, I'm back into golf. So I'm like committed, fully committed to golf as an extracurricular hobby activity, et cetera, a place to just go grind. I just like the grind. I like just the activity. If I could, back in the day, I used to think I'm going to get enough money that I could basically run my life like I'm a sports team and then just not play on Sunday or not play <laughs> on whatever day. I just like Love the it. whole experience, yeah. but it's also very solo, right? I'd rather be the guy on the field than the guy who owns the sports team naturally. I'm just like, I'd rather play. Right. I don't want to you know, right. own the team. Who cares about that? You're still like right. out of shape. But you buy a team because you can't play anymore. Yeah, Or exactly. you wish you could have played. And so how do you, what are some of the the similarities maybe of the business guy that does well and the athlete, or what are the things that you think that both of them should know about each other? Because not every day is it the same where you're just like, I'm going to go putt, chip, hit drives, not talk to anyone, grind my face off, and then, you know, go out to the front tee with the the mentality of I'm going to, I'm going to dominate this. Right. It's, it's in, in business, even it's relationships a lot of times. So I'm not like, I just want to beat this guy. You know, whereas in right. sports, a lot of times I can, I can just be like, oh, I just want to win. You know, but you still need a relationship with your team. You yeah. So still break need this a connection down with your how, team. how, how we could either take that mentality over. What should, what, where, where are they both doing well? Yeah. Where's the overlap? Where's, yeah. where's the similarities? Cause I, I want to do well in business. I get I this question you. all the time. They are the same. The same principles apply. That's why when you are an athlete, you really do well usually in business because you've had that mm. opportunity to face adversity. You've had to overcome challenges. You've had to work with the team. You have faced setbacks and rejection along the way. So 
it does make you resilient. It does help you become stronger. You know what it's like to really work together as a team and even a group of golfers. Yeah, I was also a problem with I was all in solo sports. But even a group of golfers, even a group of golfers, though, you still have a team. Like if you're on a college golf team, I spoke to Auburn Golf and a number of golf teams. Look at the Ryder Cup. You're still on a team and you still need to make each other better. And even as a golfer, you have your coach, you have your parents, you have your supporters. You still have a little bit of your team. Everyone really has their team. I worked with Jimmy Johnson when he was a race car driver. I worked with his team and spoke to them twice and Chad Noss, his, his, um, you know, his crew chief. And, you know, they were a team. They wanted to be a better team. So I was talking to them about how how to be a better team. So again, it looks like it's solo, but everyone needs a team to be successful. So I always tell those solo people, how do you lead your team? How do you manage your team? How do you lead yourself? But when I look back as an athlete, you know, myself, like, I was focused me on me. I was focused on more my success yep. rather than the team's success. Like I wanted the team to win, but how did I play? That's what mattered most. Yep. So I wasn't worried about me. So I wasn't the best teammate when I look back. I wish I could have been a better teammate. But being a great leader who serves your team, who helps them grow, what you find is that you grow the most when you help others grow. Mm-hmm. When you help others improve, you improve. When you're a teammate that makes the people around you better, you get better. So the best leaders, the best teammates in sports or business are transformational leaders. Culture is the same for both. You got to build a great culture on your team. You got to have a vision and mission for your business and also your team and what you want to accomplish as an athlete. Hmm. You've got to stay positive on the journey in business and leadership. Your belief determines the success that you create for both. You got to make sure you get rid of energy vampires and those negative people that will sabotage your team in business and sports and your schools. We work with a ton of school districts that get rid of energy vampires. Businesses get rid of energy vampires or address them. We say, put that elephant on your desk and remind everyone, no elephants in the room. We're going to deal with the real issues. We're going to have the difficult conversations in order to get better. So we talk about that a lot, dealing with negativity. I believe we work with so many companies and entrepreneurs and organizations because we help them deal with the negativity that so often sabotages their success. So you got to address it. The biggest mistake that leaders in all teams and all organizations make is they don't address the negativity that exists. They sugarcoat it or they hope it goes away or they don't want to rock the boat. So guess what? It persists, it exists, and eventually it sabotages the team. So you got to make sure we address that. Building great relationships are essential for sports and business. It's the foundation upon which winning teams are built, those relationships. No one creates success alone. We all need a team to be successful. So I tell some great stories around that on teamwork and relationships, engagement. Got to have the four C's, communication, connection, commitment, and caring. And then love and accountability. You got to make sure that, okay, there are standards. You set the standard on the team, in the business. This is our standard. And then you can actually point out when people are not meeting those standards but I'm going to love you along the way. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to support you, but I'm also going to challenge you to meet this standard. And guess what? When they know you love them, you earn the right to challenge them because you've built a relationship. You've built the trust. And because of that, if you really care about someone, if you really want someone to be great, you won't let them settle for average. You will push that person to become the best that they can be. That's real love. And loving that person, guess what? When you love them, Man, they rise to a higher level. When you believe in them, they accomplish more than they ever thought possible. Would you ever be a coach or own a team? I would own a team if I if I could, but I am a coach to coaches. Yeah. So, but I, in sports, like, in would sports. you would you ever want to take a team? Like, oh, of course I would. I mean, I think there'd be. Who's a, the guy that's like going viral right now that everyone's talking about? College? Deion Sanders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deion Sanders. You, you like his stuff? I love Deion. Deion believes. Deion is an overbeliever like Dabo Sweeney. A lot of similarities between Dabo and Deion. And you look out, I mean, what he's accomplishing this first year, give that guy some time of building his culture. People think he's arrogant. He's not arrogant. He's very confident. Mm -hmm. He's a believer. He's helping his team overcome the naysayers and the energy vampires. So I like Dean a lot. He's a strong person of faith, a strong man of faith. He truly believes. He gets his team to believe. Now, they just got beat by USC. They got beat by Oregon. So the magic, in a way, like, is run out very quickly, like all the hype. But he's going to keep building that team, and he's going to keep helping them grow. 
And then next year, you get some offensive linemen, some defensive linemen, build that stronger team. Look out. Like, he is going to be a force to be reckoned with in college football. I watched Clemson do the same thing, work with Dabo Sweeney the past 12 years, watched him build a team that won two national championships. So I saw it firsthand. Dave Roberts, Coach Dave Roberts, when he got the job as the manager of the Dodgers, watched him win a World Series. Eric Spolstra, the Miami Heat, worked with Eric, watched him obviously win an NBA championship, several and then go to the finals several times. Like, really cool to see. Like, unbelievable leader. Great coach. Sean McVay, great leader, great coach. Worked with Sean ever since he was 30 years old as a new coach in the NFL. So working with all these different coaches, all these different leaders, you see where they are, you see where they're going, you see how they build things, mm -hmm. you see how they build their culture, you see some of the challenges they face, you work with them through those challenges, you're a voice for their leaders on their team. I just got back from the Miami Heat working with their leadership team. I taught them the one truth. A lot of the principles from that really well received. Eric said it was like the best that they've ever had me share, you know, all these years. Wow. And and again, I've worked with them a ton. He's like, yeah, just, just hit the mark. And I know it does. Like in the past, I would say things I thought I knew to be true. Now I'm like, this is the key. Wow. And that conviction is much more powerful. But work with all these coaches you just learn, like, it's a great leadership laboratory because in business, it's not like everyone's watching a leader turn around a company. It's not like they're watching the leader create the culture. Yep. But in sports, Probably. you're watching on Sunday. Yep. You're watching that game being played. You're watching that season unfold. How is that team doing? What does the culture look like? Are they living these principles? You are exposing what's happening to the world to see millions of people are watching you, your leadership, your culture, your team dynamics play out. And guess what? You can tell pretty quickly how that culture is, what the leadership is like. And if they have issues, I could spot a team's issues very quickly. I was with one team. I'm not going to share who, but I was with one team and I watched practice and they were going to play a game and I'm meeting with the, the leadership team, all the coaching staff. And they said, so what do you notice? You said you can notice things. They thought they got me, like, you know, one of the assistant coaches. So so you said you can actually tell energy and team dynamics. What did you notice? I go, well, I can tell there's this one guy that doesn't feel like he's part of the team and doesn't really care about the team. And he's actually probably a big challenge for you all. What? How'd you know? Did, did, he, did coach tell you? No. No, I was watching. I could tell. I get a hit, like an intuitive hit. I could see the dynamics playing out. And I can tell you're not going to win a lot of games with that dynamic. Wow. So you can see it and you've been with enough teams. I like get yeah. doctor spots, symptoms and patterns and is able to tell if something's possibly wrong. We should do some tests on it. Yeah. I can be with a team and tell pretty quickly cool. or a leader and even tell the leader what their issues are and what their challenges are and help that leader grow through that challenge, help that team get better because you can spot the symptoms and the patterns. I was with another coach on the phone the other day. It's amazing how many had been reaching out and he was telling me a challenge that he had. And he was talking about the symptom. And I said, but yeah, that's, that's understandable. I see that, but, but it's because there's a root issue mm -hmm. and here's the root. Am I correct? Yes, you are. And that's I knew the root. And it's good to be able to, the principle that you just talked about, the symptom and the root and the difference of the two. There's people that also say that those who can do and those that can't teach the, but there is, I think that that's dumb first off, because there's some people that are just like some golf coaches. They weren't the best golfer in the world. And that doesn't mean Tiger Woods is a good golf coach. So it's a little weird. But I don't think he'll be a great golf coach because usually the best in the world are not the best coaches. Like so that's Michael what I was going to ask you. Like, what's the difference a, between Michael the, Jordan like, doesn't make a great coach because so often what makes you a great player doesn't make you a great coach. So often the best players can't understand why someone is is so average or someone doesn't work harder or someone doesn't give more yeah, yeah. or they're not mentally tougher. So someone who is usually that high, such a high performer in that way, often doesn't make the best coach. It's rare that you can find someone who is the best in the world or, or great and also be a great coach. And what do you think the biggest difference is? Like, is it the coach knows what it's like to be average? Like, what is it? I think because you're a coach who's not the best, You've had to work to always address your issues and your challenges. And there were things that kept you from being your best. Like for me, as a D1 athlete, I wasn't the best athlete. I wasn't the best player. 
but I had a lot of mental struggles along the way of fear and adversity and challenges. And that's what prepared me to actually help so many now. So I think so often what you had to go through prepared you, prepared you to be a better coach, to be a better leader. And to be a great leader, a great coach, you have to truly care about the other person. And it's about you bringing out the best in them and understanding what issues they're facing, what's holding them back. And the best in the world don't often think about what are those little issues that are holding you back and how you can get better from that. I don't know why that is. We could probably explore that even deeper, but it's usually the makeup of a person. And there are those that are teachers and there are those that are, you know, the best doers. So I do believe like often the best doer is not always the best teacher. Bill Belichick, wasn't the best player, but he was a good player. Sean McVay had a horrible college career. He was high school player of the year in a state in Georgia, but then goes to Miami of Ohio and gets injured and didn't have the career he wanted to have. And as a result of that, he winds up becoming a coach at a young age and has become a savant as a coach. If he doesn't have those injuries and setbacks, he might not be the coach he is. So you can see how different things make you who you are along the way. The best salespeople don't always make the best sales managers. Correct. And how often do we do that in companies? Someone's a great salesperson. They have the best sales. So we make them a sales manager and they flounder in that role because they're great at doing, but they're not great at teaching. Yeah. Some are great at both doing and teaching. Yeah. And I've learned for me, like I'm, I'm a driver. I've got to work at developing others. I do it naturally in the course of our conversations yeah. as we're meeting Everyone I meet, I want to make them better. So there's that natural teacher in me and coach in me that wants to make everyone better. But when I'm driving, I'm in drive mode, performance mode of the athlete. Yeah. And there are moments when I've got to make sure that I slow down to call my team, to talk to my team, to be intentional, to help them grow. And I'm going to admit, I'm not always the best at that because sometimes I'm in driving mode, not teaching mode. But you put me in that room with my team for a few minutes, I'm just going to start teaching. You put me on a plane with some guy, I'm going to start teaching that guy on the plane next to me. This guy was reading Overthinking. It was a book about dealing with overthinking. And I had the one truth next to me. I'm like, hey, can I teach you something for like just a few minutes on where overthinking comes from? Because the book wasn't sharing that. It was just sharing strategies. But again, I don't teach symptoms. I teach the root. I don't teach just a specific strategy. I teach why it's happening and why a strategy will work. And then what's the best strategy for you? Cause not everyone applies the same strategies or should use the same strategies. We got to know who you are, what be- works best for you and then apply the strategy. So, so that's how I, I always get to the root and the core, which I think is so much more powerful. Now, is it is sexy on Instagram to go, I'm going to give you three ways. I'm going to give you two things to do this and just do this. Okay. Those are helpful at times, but a lot of times if you don't get to the root of that or the core of that, I don't think this is powerful. So I don't think it's sexy, but I actually think it's more powerful. Yeah. I mean, you think about it with weight loss and things like that new technique only lasts you until that challenge is over or whatever. If we don't just like change who you are or you just make different decisions, but how do you get to that, right. that point? And you've talked a lot about one truth being something that you're passionate about, which has been very cool. Cause I, you know, you have plenty of books to pull from. So you're like, Oh, one truth that like, this is the, something I'm excited about. You're also writing another one. So for people thinking, Oh, well maybe it's cause it's this, this is the book that's on his in front of him right now. It's like, well, you have many books selling all over. You're writing one right now. You could be talking about the one that you're writing, but one truth comes up. You talked about the sports team. I think it was Miami that you said, this was my best talk. Right. Kind of that, that oneness separateness kind of talk about that and why it's so powerful in this book. It's obviously a special book to you. Uh, I would I'd break that down a little bit because it's it's exciting to you, exciting to them. Yep. So what the heck is exciting inside Yeah, why is it so exciting? Well, I want to go back to one thing you said earlier also. You talked about how, you know, the journey of getting better, improving. Like I spoke to your, your group yep. and I look back on that. I shared three acronyms. That was too many. If I can go back and do it again. And what's cool is you told me that like four times. Yeah. Because you're I, like, oh, I think it was too much. But, I shouldn't but, have done that. And you know that. what's great about that? Okay. So I wish I didn't do it, but that experience allowed me to get better. And I made sure I never did that again. So every other talk, it's either one acronym, the most two, but mostly just one. And that's so much more powerful as a result of that. So everything you do along the way, even if you don't nail it, even if you don't hit the mark like you want to, or think you can, or think you should, you still can use that experience in order to get better along the way and improve. 
And so with the one truth, you don't want to look backwards of your past and live in the past. The one truth in many ways is about being present in the moment because when you're connected to the moment, you experience oneness. When you're living here but thinking about the past, there's a separation between your thoughts and your reality. So your reality yeah. is right here, right now, but your thoughts are back in the past yep. and there's a separation. Everything in life comes down to oneness and separateness. Do I feel one, connected? Do I feel one with myself, with others, relationship, connection? And do I feel one with God, the creator of the universe? You're meant to be connected to your creator. You're not meant to be separate from your creator. Mm -hmm. He created us to be in relationship with him, to be connected to him. And in that connection, that's when we thrive. Just as the fish is connected to the water and swims in the water, or the tree thrives in the soil that it's meant to be connected to, mm -hmm. pull that tree away from the soil, tree doesn't do very well. Correct. Grow it in the soil, it thrives. When we are flourishing, when we are one with God, we then are flourishing and we are growing and we are thriving. So we're meant to be. But everything in life, there's a force that's always dividing and separating us from God, from ourselves, and from other people. There's always negativity, there's division, there's bitterness, there's fighting, there's all these things that come along. We call it broken relationships. Yeah. We say broken marriages. The root for the Greek word of anxious means to separate and divide. Wow. So when you feel anxious, you feel separate, you feel divided. I was on the plane the other day and looked around, everybody was wearing headphones or you know headsets. Think about that. We're sitting next to someone, but we're in our own world. And then this one group of people were talking, you know, in, in the in the two seats over here, and everyone's looking at them like, "What's wrong with you? Like, why are you actually talking on this plane? Yeah. You're talking to another human being? What are you crazy? It's almost become the abnormal to do that, and it's normal to actually Correct. be in your own world, separated from others. And the more you feel separate, you feel weak." You feel powerless. You feel anxious and worried and stressed and negative. When you move from oneness to separateness, you move from positive to negative. All mental health disorders report feelings of being alone, isolated, disconnected, and separate. Think about that. Like everybody who's ever dealt with a mental health disorder feels that way in those times. What's happening? You're moving from oneness to separateness. Let's look at overthinking. How can we have never say, oh, that person's overthinking or I'm overthinking. I have too many positive thoughts. Yeah, no one thinks that. Why is overthinking always associated with negative thoughts? Because too much thought and it's those negative thoughts that are always coming in that creates the clutter in your mind. That clutter creates a lower state of mind that creates the division and separateness that you feel. When you have a higher state of mind, you don't have a lot of thoughts. You have a lot of clarity, yeah. you have a lot of focus. You have peace. You have a lot of positivity. So the enemy is always going to come in and try to divide you and separate you and create this clutter in your mind yeah. and fill your mind with all these thoughts, with the five Ds that I wrote about in the book. Doubt, distortion, which are negative thoughts, are lies that will tell you things about yourself and your future that just aren't true. There's discouragement. We don't give up because it's hard. We give up because we get discouraged. So all these thoughts come in and they're often negative and they separate us and they make us feel disconnected. So we get discouraged. And then there's distraction. Distractions are the enemy of greatness. So maybe you're not discouraged. Maybe you don't want to give up. But if the enemy won't make you bad, he'll make you busy. He'll keep you distracted on all wow. the things that don't matter instead of what does matter. And that fifth D, which is divide, which is, as I said earlier, the root word for anxious means to separate and divide. So think about it. Negative thoughts separate, divide weaken and make you feel powerless, separateness, oneness, positive thoughts, love, connection, power, yeah. peace, purpose. And you can see the two differences. So the more connected I am, the more powerful I feel. So I was talking to this woman. She was an entrepreneur. She's, she's a, at a business event. And I had spoken and she came up to me afterwards. She said, can I talk to you for a second? She said, I keep starting new businesses. Because every time I don't, I get really negative and I get really down. And all these negative thoughts start to take hold. I said, what's happening is you feel the separateness. A lot of people fill the gap and the separateness with bad things like drugs or alcohol or porn or, you know, video games. 
all the things that keep you from feeling what you're meant to feel. It's actually temporary relief. But what makes you feel better, it doesn't make you better. Yeah. It often makes you feel worse. So we feel these things with in our life with all the stuff that that is not good for us. I said, you're feeling it with that, at least some that's actually making you successful and making you a lot of money. So she and her husband keep on making more and more money and being successful, but at the same time, it's not making her any happier. Yeah. Because again, she's not dealing with the root. So on the surface, it looks like they have a ton of success in everything. At the core, eventually that will be her demise if she doesn't address it. And I said to her, I bet you feel really far from God and separate from God. You probably felt connected to him at one time in your life, but now you feel really separate. She goes, yeah, how'd you know? I go, well, if you were feeling connected to God, you would not be feeling all the negative thoughts, anxiousness and Mm -hmm. stress and all those negative emotions every time you had peace or time of calm, I shouldn't say peace, time of calm and quietness where you weren't building something. You would actually feel really good during those times if you were connected to God. The fact that you are feeling this way is a sign that you're feeling separate. If you were connected to God, you would feel awesome. You'd feel joy. You'd feel love. You'd feel power. It made so much sense to her. Yeah. She's like, what do I do? Well, you got to start developing a relationship with God. You got to start connecting to God. There's a hole in your soul. There's a wound in your soul that needs to be healed. And guess what? We all have this hole that needs to be healed. But how do you heal it? Well, you heal it with love and forgiveness. Relational psychology says we heal in a loving relationship. But can you heal with a stranger? No. No. Has to be a loving relationship. Mm -hmm. If God is a stranger, he can't heal you. It has to be a personal God, a God of love and forgiveness that cares about you and wants to heal you. In that relationship where God's not a stranger and you develop this intimacy and connection, it's where healing takes place. So that's how she would move from separateness to healing by spending time with God and connecting to God. And then I found out that she didn't trust God because of things that happened in her life, which makes a lot of sense. The very thing that will help you heal trust in God is what the enemy uses to keep you from God. So he'll do certain things in your life and create certain circumstances where you're betrayed, where you're hurt, where you're wounded. And these are the very things that keep you from a relationship with God. He takes away the very trust that you need to heal. And so we have to move past the hurt, past the pain, and realize that God did not do the hurting, but God wants to heal your hurting. And in healing you, that's how he'll redeem you and restore you to be who you're meant to be. So that's why oneness is so important. And separateness actually causes us to be all that God didn't create us to be. It causes us to actually move towards dysfunction and despair and to and to ultimately want to give up. But as we move towards oneness, we become someone who actually feels the love of God. And then he gives us power in that relationship, not our own power. Separateness is we try to do it our own and have our own power. Mm -hmm. God tries to give us like true, real power, his power to go change the world and impact the world. What would you rather live with? Your own power? You can't even blow up a balloon without getting tired. But God could expand the universe. Yeah, I'll take God's power. What's interesting about the D's that you said you had five of them in the book that people can go through and really go through this process is that they kind of seem like a revolving door that if you were to be have doubt, discouragement, all these things, then your thoughts of what people do towards you, you'll take them more wrong, which will create that strife. You talked about the disconnectedness and then you're in isolation because you're not connected to anyone because you're thinking everyone, oh, they, they didn't even open the door for me or Nicholas didn't say hi or John didn't say hi to me. He must... They have all these negative thoughts about it, which is interesting. So if anyone's lived for a while that's listening to this, the longer you've lived, you probably recognize this in your own life is that most people that have lived longer, they have more of those. And Jesus even says, become more like a child because they really haven't lived long enough to have at least long-term effects of all of it. A lot of them, you know, my son believes he's stronger than me. He's like fully convinced, you know, (laughs) he's upset if anything else is different. And so he doesn't have all this baggage in each one of those areas or hasn't had long enough time with them to see those things come up over and over again. For someone who's 20, 30, 40, 50, they've probably noticed things that have been repeat for them over and over. They may get over it for a little bit, the the symptom, but then all of a sudden that core thing that's always been their Achilles yeah. heel comes back every three years, every three months, every three weeks. 
And so I, I just look at this as something that's like, the longer people have lived, the more that they probably dealt with this. I don't know what Big you've time. seen with that. And you're tuned into the patterns of the past. Yeah. That's the thing. You've created this tuning, this frequency where now you've tuned into the negative. And so your soul has been encumbered by dysfunctions and patterns of the past and negativity and fears and doubts. And it becomes a part of, of your nature. It becomes a part of your soul. Wow. And it becomes a wound that creates what? Separation. What is a wound? But separation. Yep. And so the key is to understand that we all have a wound, but through God's spirit and love is how you renew the mind and renew the soul. Romans 8, 5, 6 says, a mind governed by the flesh leads to death. Mm -hmm. A mind governed by the spirit leads to life and peace. So think about it. Yeah. Is your mind being governed by the flesh, the things of this world, the patterns of this world, the hurts of this world, the TV, the Netflix shows, all that stuff? Yeah. Or is it being governed by the spirit? Yeah. Am I taking time for prayer? Am I, am I connecting with the creator of the universe? The love of God and in that connection that heals and renews me. That's why taking time and connecting is so important. Like I don't think Christians spend enough time in prayer connecting with the creator. Yeah. We talk about reading the Bible and I think that's important. But if you're reading the Bible, but you're not open to the spirit of God, even while you're reading it, it's not going to do much for you. Yeah. If you're, I mean, if your wife only read your books and she never hung out with you, that'd be still probably not that oh, beneficial to her, right? Oh, that's good. That's really good. Yeah. Just reading the books is, is not enough. Yeah. Like she gets to know more about who you are, but the connection comes through oh, sitting together. Really? I never thought of it like that. That is, I'm going to have to use that going forward. Thank you, Nicholas. That's, that's a great one. Yeah. Yeah. Because, right. You're not spending time with the creator of the universe. Yeah. That's that really means good. you don't really trust God and you're at, you don't actually believe God is actually a being yeah. or a personal creator that is here with you and wants to spend time with you. So think about it. They may have accepted Jesus, but they haven't allowed God to actually heal their soul. Yeah. And so they're going to heaven, but their soul right now is actually still living in hell. So we need to make time to bathe in the Holy Spirit. There's the flesh. Well, there's the spirit and there's the flesh. Yeah. And the soul is the integrator between the two. The soul is in the middle of the flesh and the spirit. What will it be governed by? And if the soul spends more time bathing in the spirit, wow. it gets healed and gets renewed, and then it drives the flesh. And that's why the more you spend time nurturing your soul and your mind, your brain actually gets healthier. Wow. So the key to mental health in many ways is a spiritual battle, not always physical. Of course, there are chemical things that happen, yep. but what drives the chemical? But the spiritual and yeah. the energetic. So for me, who was depressed and I was anxious, and I was stressed all the time. And I had major angst. And my wife wanted me to go on medication and do all these things. I said, no, wow. let me just see if I can do it. You know, on my own, let me just see. When I said on my own, it started my own practice in gratitude. Yeah. I'm taking these walks every day, practicing gratitude. What was I doing? Tuning my brain to a higher frequency. Yeah. And what does gratitude do? It moves you away from self and towards God. Yeah. Away from disconnection and towards connection away from lack and towards abundance. So now I'm connecting to something greater by practicing gratitude because gratitude causes you to be grateful for something beyond yourself. You don't say, I'm just thankful for me. Yeah. You're thankful for other people, other things, and hopefully right. for God. So those walks of prayer start to change my mind and soul, wow. which then started to change my brain. Then they became walks of prayer. Yep. As I started walking and praying, now I'm renewing my mind often. And now I think completely different. Wow. Now my brain is completely different because I'm giving it different fuel. I'm giving it the spirit of God instead of the flesh of this world. Low yeah. grade energy versus the highest grade energy that there is on the planet and in yep. the universe. That changes your mindset. It changes how you function. It changes what you think, how you work and how you behave. Guess what? I've been doing this walks for over 18 years now. Wow. Those books have come about because of those walks of prayer yeah, and gratitude. The ideas I have come about because of those walks and prayer. The connection I have with God when I pray and take time to connect with him, that's when I get these ideas of this is what you're meant to do. Oh, here's this idea. And I share with my team. They're like, oh, great idea. How'd you know that? I'm not that smart. The more we renew our mind, we get smarter 
because God's spirit, his intelligence, his wisdom, his words starts to move through us. The Bible's written down on paper, but guess what? It's also written in your heart and soul. Yeah. It's already written within you. Yep. That's why when you read it in the Bible, it rings true because you already know the truth within your heart and your soul. Yeah. You talked about activities. And even for me, I thought about, you had talked about oneness, separateness, and we do these things to kind of muddle, like to dull that pain temporarily. And I even caught myself because you can read the Bible or serve people for wrong reasons. And so I almost caught myself sometimes going, well, sometimes I'll read or pray because of the separateness feeling rather than being like, God, I want to sit with you, enjoy Baskin, but it's like, I need to read this far into the Bible or I need to pray this long, you know, and I kind of go through it and I was like, okay, well, even that can be an area where I'm going, well, maybe I can do that gut check, go, am I feeling separate right now? And that's why I'm like anxiously praying or or reading because I think I have to, or else like I'm just looking for something that'll make me feel better. And it just made me do like an internal audit, which I thought was really I cool. I love that you said that. It's it's the heart yeah. behind it. It's the intention behind it. It's like customer service. You can be taught a technique yeah. to have great customer service, yeah, but yeah. If there's no heart behind it. Right. The Ritz Carlton, they say, thank you very much, sir. And they could say it the right way, but if they don't really mean it or feel it, yeah. you don't feel it. Yeah. Well, you could be reading the word or volunteering and serving. But if you're doing it out of obligation instead of love, and you can be on a volunteer site, you can be in a homeless shelter serving and still not feeling one or connected to God. You can be in church yep. and still not feel connected to the creator of the universe. Yeah. So it's about that connection where healing and love takes place. Gallup did a poll and a study and they found that 99% of couples who pray together stay together. Yeah, that's so great. 50% yeah. go to church. 50% go to church is no different than unchurched. Yeah. So what's the difference? It's prayer. Why is that? Because your spirit, your spouse's spirit, God is spirit. So when you're praying, you're becoming one spirit together. Yeah. And in that prayer, you're all being renewed and healed together. God is healing you in that moment together. Families who pray together, it's important We'll pray with our family. We'll send prayers. When I pray for my kids, I'm sure they feel it. Praying for your kids is so important. That prayer, that intention, that heart, mm -hmm. that's what makes the difference. Going to church, reading your Bible out of obligation, doing all these things that are legalistic, but yeah. not the heart of God is exactly what Jesus talked about. Yeah. The Pharisees prayed. Yeah. Long prayers. The religious people prayed. But who you're praying to and why are you praying? Yep. And who are you connecting with? And Jesus is all about connecting through him because it's through him that he creates the oneness. See, that's why Jesus is so important. He is the bridge. He is the one who takes our, our burden, our pain, our sin, and allows us to become one spirit with the creator of the universe. And in that one spirit, God and us, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are now one spirit. Now we become truly renewed. Our spirit comes alive. That alive spirit renews our mind, our soul, our brain, our body, and every aspect of our lives. And that's what you bring to this world. Yeah. And that's why Christians, if you're in business, you should be confident when your intention is a godly intention because I'm doing it for the right reasons, the right purpose. I'm driven by the spirit, not the flesh. Mm. And that gives you power to create success in the flesh. Try to lead with the flesh. You might have temporary success, but long-term, it will fizzle out. And we see that often with non-Christians and Christians as well. This has been enlightening on both sides, whether someone's like, I'm feeling all those symptoms and I'm doing all these crazy things, or even, man, I'm I'm a Christian and I'm thinking, I have an event coming up this week. I go, oh, wow, how can I you know, ask God to walk in the Spirit more where I'm not you know, planning things just based on the, the frameworks, the flesh and all of that? So on both sides, I'm going, okay, where can I apply this and take it to the next level? I know you as per a person who you came into our group and you said you talked too many acronyms. So for people that grab the one truth, it's like, I know that you're a breaker downer. Of, right. Okay. Here's how we break this down. Here's how you remember it. Here's how you implement it. Here's how you do it. So for the people listening, one, I think they could just go to, is it onetruth.com? Yeah, getonetruth.com. Getonetruth.com get one truth. To, to get the book, to actually get those frameworks. Because though you're touching on it, and giving the above view, 
I know him as someone who breaks down frameworks, which is big for people applying things. They need to have something they they can do leaving there. And I know that, that and then belief, other stories that they can go through and build that belief as well. The people who have read the book, what I love is they say it's profound, insightful, but then very practical. Yeah. And that's how I wanted to write it. I wanted to teach these deeper understandings. Yep. Again, I wrote it also for Christians. I wrote it for non-Christians because I want them to experience and connect and really feel the oneness that God has for them. Yep. Because God wants to create oneness with his children and everyone's made in the likeness and image of God. Yep. So I truly believe God wants a relationship with all of us. So I wrote it. Hopefully people will find their way to him and experience that, that oneness. Again, truth is truth. It's not religion. Someone came after me the day said, oh, I love the book until the religious part. It's not a religious part. It's the truth part. The Bible is the only book that explains the oneness and separateness and how to come back to oneness. The Old Testament is a story of separation, Adam and Eve in the garden, getting separated from God and from each other relationally. Yeah. And the New Testament is all about coming back into oneness yeah. with God. And it's a prescription for that. Take every thought captive. Don't be conformed by the patterns of this world. Be transformed by the renewing mm -hmm. of our mind. John 17 talks about, Father, help them be as one as we are one. Oneness. Everything is about oneness. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branch. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Yeah. But if you remain in me and I in you, you will produce much fruit. Oneness. Yeah. So the New Testament is actually teaching oneness. But it's not a religious book. It's actually a book of truth that says if you want to experience oneness with the creator of the universe, here's how. It's not teaching religion. It's teaching you how to create with with the how to connect with the creator of the universe. <laughs> so it blows my mind and it bothers me a little bit when when people say it's a religious book. No, it's not about religion because Jesus wasn't about religion. Jesus hated religion. He was all about creating relationship. So the one truth is about that. But I also wrote it for Christians who believe but are still struggling and suffering mm -hmm. and have not been healed in their soul. And it explains why and how they can definitely do the healing that will help them get to that higher state of mind and feel more connected to God. Because I had to answer the question, okay, I write this book. I am sharing the truth. Why are there so many Christians who struggle with their mental health? Yeah. Why are so many Christians deal with anxiety and fear and just all of these mental health issues that a lot of people are also dealing with. If Jesus is the answer, then why aren't Christians doing a whole lot better? Why aren't they all thriving? Yep. And the answer is because their souls need healing because they've accepted Jesus as their savior in their spirit, but their soul still needs to be healed over time, which will heal the body, the brain, and, and every aspect of their life. And also the brain is an antenna. And a lot of Christians the more you've tuned into the negative over time, the negative frequency, the voice of the enemy, you could be a Christian and be tuned into that voice. You're tuning into the voice of fear and worry and doubt and negativity. And the more you've tuned into that, that becomes your playlist. Yep. That's your favorite station. So you get into the car, it's automatically playing. Yep. You wake up, it's automatically playing. So those Christians have to tune that dial where they start to tune into the voice of God. They gotta read more of the word, and they've got to spend more time connecting to God, praying to God, and trusting in God, and surrendering to God. And that's why I created an acronym in there for prayer, P-R-A-Y-E-R, because -E a lot of people don't really even know how to pray. Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer, which is the ultimate way, and prayer explains what's ultimately in the Lord's Prayer, but how to do it at a practical level today. And I added E-R. E-R is expect, so there's P-R-A-Y, praise, repent, ask God, Yield, which is surrender, expect and trust. Get a trust in God. And the R is key, receive. A lot of Christians don't receive yeah. what God has for them, the blessings God had for, has for them because they don't feel worthy. No, receive the blessings and everything God wants to give you and do through you. And part of that is obedience. I say, God, I receive all the people you want me to help. I receive those who are meant to hear this message. I receive those you want me to coach. And sure enough, a guy will reach out to me and said, hey, my son and daughter really struggling with this, this, and this. Can you give me some ideas? Can you help them? Yes, I make time for that person because I prayed I got to help that one person. So receive what God has for you. And that starts to change your life and receive 
the spirit that renews your mind. So I wrote the one truth for Christians too. And I think when they read it, it gives them a blueprint and understanding and an insight and a practical way to now go live the truth of God and apply it to your life. So I'm not trying to replace the Bible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's only one Bible. I'm trying to explain for a lot of people what Jesus is really saying and why it's so important and what we need to do. And here's how to do it. Well, thank you for breaking it down even further as well. And so get one truth. And then if they're interested in some of the certifications or speaking stuff and all these new leadership things that you're doing, uh, obviously to have you speak as well, but all those different avenues, what's the best way for them to get connected to that as well? If they're yeah. like, this seems really cool. Yeah, two places. My website is johngordon.com, J-O-N gordon.com. If you want me to speak, I love speaking at events. I love making an impact. It's, it's what I do. Yeah. I don't need to do it anymore, but I am doing it because yeah. I'll do it till I'm dead. This is what I'm here to do. Or until you own, own the sports team. No, it's like, I'll you still better do it. get him before. I'll still do it. Oh, still do it. They'll still do it. No, we, we've talked about that. My wife and I, like, no matter what level, like, I really have achieved a level of financial freedom based on my book sales and all the royalties I get. Thank God. And we donate a ton to charities and nonprofits. But I reached that level where I don't need to speak, but I'm still doing a lot of events. Yeah. I was in, I was in Arkansas getting bed bugs, put it that way, speaking to a school district. And I woke up, I'm like, what, what am I, what am I doing? Yeah. And then the voice said, cause this is what you're meant to do. Cause yep. you're, this is your purpose Very good. to reach those thousands of teachers you're going to reach right now who will impact tens of thousands of students. Wow. And it got you started and it's what you're going to still do to this day. And when God tells me to stop, I'll stop. But if he keeps me going, I'll continue to do it. So whether it's a school district, a large company conference, a big organization, I love to speak. So johngordon.com or John Gordon Certified, which is if they want to get trained or oh. develop themselves as a speaker, a facilitator, a presenter. I've had at least 10 people now that are making, you know, over a million dollars or close to it based on working with me and being mentored. Wow. And so if it's someone wants to do that, certification is, is the place to start. Cool. People always reach out asking for free advice, you know, like on that. I'll give you a free advice if you're dealing with a challenge in your life. But for something like this, just get certified and, and come through that path because that's what I'm pouring into in that realm. I'm, I'm multiplying through all these people who want to train and teach yeah. and present. That's the avenue that allows me to now speak into them, to train them, to develop them. If you want that, come to, through that program and I'll, and I'll mentor you through that. I, I was around podcasters at one point and I thought because I was around them, I'd kind of glean from them what to do. And then one time I was sitting there and I was like, I've made no progress in this area. I get that little free advice here and there. Right. And so really people have to ask themselves, all, if they're interested in this is like, what's more costly? Getting that couple of little free advice, but you're not really making progress. Time's ticking by, or I ended up paying one of these guys and we actually launched a show 2016 we were, we beat Tony Robbins, Eric Warre, everything. And I had hardly any followers or any, it just, it was on the top of the charts for six weeks straight. Wow. And I was like, I paid this guy, but I was around him all the time. And even right now, one of my best friends, I pay the most amount of money to right now because he never was sitting down giving me the blueprint. And we were just chat here and there. And, and sometimes it's like, well, I have to look at costs a different way. And so, like you said, you'll give someone you know, if someone's hurting or something, can't physically do something, but if someone's out there and they're, they're feeling this is a place I need to go, I highly push them to like, the investment saves the money if it's something you actually want to do. Oh yeah. If you want to do this, you'll exponentially, one, grow yourself as a leader. Yep. So even if you don't want to teach this, John Gordon Certified is also for any leader who wants to be a better leader. Because as you yep. go through this program, you're going to grow your capacity as a leader. You're going to grow your influence and your ability to connect with the people that you lead and communicate awesome. to those people as well. So it, it's key for that aspect as well. But I love what you said about even paying your friends or paying people who are close to you to say, okay, really in, help me grow here. I've done the same thing, you know, recently, and it's been really great to say, all right, let's invest in this because it's worth it. Yep. And you wind up getting like the word 10 X is used a lot, but you get 10 X to 20 X. Yeah, I'm sure you're guys making over, over a million dollars to ride around there got a little bit more than 10 oh. X on, on their, on yes, their investments. So. Friends mentored them to get book deals. A yeah. recent guy just got a big book deal by coaching him. I thought, okay. And people want to write a book. I'll actually meet with those people who want to write a book and I'll meet with them. It's, it's one day 
I'll, I'll take a day to meet with someone who wants to write a book mm -hmm. and it's not cheap, but I'll meet with that person. And by the time that person's done, they will literally have a framework for their book. Yeah. And even probably a name and a title for that book. That's what happened to this recent guy. I just met with him for the day. Boom, has a book, got a book deal. It's his brand. It's his essence. It just all came through. It was really powerful. And I love doing that too. And I haven't done a ton of that, but I want to do more of that. Like spend that one day. And I'll also do it for if that person can't afford one day because it's a hundred thousand for for one day. Yeah. But if someone wants to do it where they can bring four other people, so they split it twenty each. Yeah. I'll take time with those five people and work with them, so it becomes more affordable for them. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. I appreciate you spending time with us and investing time with us and being on God's business, really breaking down how God and business together. I mean, your books didn't even do anything before Jesus became a part of it. Amen. It doesn't always go that way. No. But I don't think you would have cared. No. But like it's the the goal for you is you said obedience and inside of that God's raised you up as a leader, but really your goal has been obedience, not where's the book sales or any right. of that. So I, I just want to honor that and thank you and John Gordon dot com, like you said, and John Gordon certified dot com. Get one truth, right? Dot get com. one truth dot com. And but, by the way, when you invest in the root, you get a great supply of fruit. And some of my books that were, you know, my most overt faith books, yep. they haven't done as well as my more secular books. But I was still being obedient, knowing I meant to write this book. And because yeah. my secular books have done so well, my publisher will allow me to do the books I want to so do, cool. even though they're not a Christian publisher. And I'll weave in some you know, faith within the stories and so forth. And it's fun to do that. And I get permission to do that. I can do any book I want because I've made my publisher so much money. Yeah. So that's God, too, like using me, like using this guy that basically came from nothing in many ways is nothing and all of that to use me to do this. I see what God's plan is. And by the way, yeah. And all of this, I know that God is the power source behind everything I do. And I'm always amazed at what he can do with so little. Yeah. <laughs> and that being my life. Thanks again. All right. Thanks so much. God bless.